Hello everybody and welcome to today's online lesson. Today we're going to be looking at the fall of the Ming and the rise of the Qing Dynasty in period 4. The last time we saw the Ming Dynasty, they were on the rise, re-emerging, creating a Confucian society. But after Zheng He dies, the Chinese government decides to destroy the huge treasure fleets and erase them from all of history thus tucking themselves in into an isolated way. This is going to be a major turning point in world history and something we're going to discuss a little bit more in class tomorrow. Exactly why do you think the Chinese isolated themselves and discontinued the treasure fleet voyages? We'll talk about that in class. Right now, we are going to say, hey, that move certainly led to the decline of the Ming Dynasty. They began to isolate themselves, regulate trade very strictly, regulate the ports, thus creating the situation for smugglers and corruption that would ultimately hurt the Ming economy. Now the story of the Ming collapse is very similar to many other empires that collapsed. First you have a series of weak rulers. This leads to corruption, this leads to uh, scholar gentry and other nobles thinking that they can uh, get more than what they should, right, and cheat the system. And also there were threats from the north from other uh, nomadic groups, and thus they had to uh, invest a lot of money and resources in protecting their borders. This, of course, was very costly and led to high taxes. Well, no one likes high taxes, especially the peasants, and these high taxes and payments eventually lead to famines and other hardships, and the peasants revolted. With all this chaos, the Ming Dynasty decide to get some help. So they go to a group in the north called the Manchus, who are a warrior group. Say, hey, can you help us come down here and police everything, get everything back in order? Well, the Manchus are more than happy to go over the Great Wall of China into the gates of Beijing and ultimately take over the government. By 1644, the Manchus sweep into Beijing and claim the Mandate of Heaven. One of the first leaders of the Qing Dynasty was Dorgon. And what I'd like you to do tonight is look on the worksheet, read and analyze his document, his decree to the people of Beijing, and then answer the question that you see on the bottom there. How will Dorgon and the Manchus rule China? Which words from the document support your findings? And as you analyze the document, I want you to think about this. Remember, Dorgon is a Manchu from the north, a foreign leader coming in to rule and occupy China. We can compare him also to Kublai Khan, Mongol, who also did the same thing. But here's this. Why does the Qing dynasty last a lot longer than the Yuan Mongol dynasty? And maybe the answer is somewhere in this document and how the Qing dynasty ruled China. We'll take a look at that here with their government because they did face um, much resistance from the Chinese who were loyal to the Ming and others who simply did not want foreign groups ruling them. So they had to handle this in certain ways. Part of that, number one, was to create a Confucian bureaucracy and continue Confucian rituals. Also to continue the civil service exams. So what they did was they carried over a lot of the Ming dynasty characteristics of government making it mostly a Confucian society. Uh, they repaired the infrastructure, they lowered taxes, they did other things to try to convince the population that they were the righteous rulers with the mandate of heaven, and they were good, benevolent rulers at that. They also continued to expand the Chinese borders, creating the question, you know, is this or was this a Chinese empire? When not only did they have the traditional tributary states, of Korea and Vietnam, but then expanding the territory in a western and northern way to Tibet, Mongolia, and Manchuria. They also captured the island of Taiwan. We do, however, see some diplomacy with the Qing Dynasty as well in the north, creating the Treaty of Nerchinsk in 1689 with the Russians. Now, another problem that the Qing Dynasty faced was that the Manchus were only 2% of the population. How does 2% of the population control all of China? Well, they had certain ways. Number one, they wanted to recognize who was on their side and who wasn't. So they forced the Chinese people to wear this hairstyle called the Q. 
Q. Q. Q. It was the shaved forehead with the long pigtail. So it was either lose your hair or lose your head. And this was a physical way of seeing who was on their side and who wasn't. Um, women also, of course, remained confined to the household. Foot binding continued, and even female infanticide uh, was very common because to have a male, a child, actually elevated your social status. Now, the greatest leader of the Qing Dynasty, and perhaps the greatest emperor of all of China, is Emperor Kangxi. Kangxi ruled for 61 years as an absolute monarch of China. So we can compare him to Emperor Hang Wu, we can compare him to Kublai Khan, we can also compare him to other figures we're going to see later in the course, especially King Louis XIV. Kangxi not only led a Confucian government, but he was a Confucian scholar himself. He created an encyclopedia and a dictionary of history and thought. And he was tolerant of other faiths like Christianity and was interested in Western technology and ideas. So what I'd like you to do right now is just take a look at this uh, documentary and then answer the question on your worksheet about Emperor Kang Shi and comparing him to either Kublai Khan or Emperor Han Wu. Take a look. Emperor Kangxi, the second emperor of the Qing dynasty, is perhaps one of the most cultured emperors in Chinese history. He ruled China for more than 60 years and had a strong passion for learning throughout his life. Emperor Kangxi was known as a diligent ruler who cared about his people. During the last years of his rule, instead of imposing heavy taxes on the peasants, he didn't tax them at all since there was surplus money in the imperial treasury. Under his benevolent rule, China prospered and the dynasty was stable. NTD 2012 dance competition male adult division silver medalist Chao Yongxing portrayed Emperor Kangxi in his dance routine. Kangxi was the emperor who ruled for the longest in Chinese history. He ascended to the throne at a very young age. When he became emperor, there were several powerful officials at the Qing court who were not satisfied with him. And because he was so young, it was hard for him to rule properly. After a lot of effort, he broke away from their influence and genuinely ruled as the emperor. Emperor Kangxi took the best of his three ancestral heritages. From his Mongolian grandmother, he learned practical life experiences and later the Mongolian language from a palace attendant. His father was Manchurian and his mother was Han Chinese. The young Kangxi learned horse riding and archery from a Manchurian master and Confucian teachings from a Han Chinese teacher. His courage and determination were influenced by his Manchurian culture his wisdom and noble spirit by his Mongolian origin, while his benevolence came from his Chinese Confucian upbringing. His openness and passion for learning was partly influenced by Western culture. All this molded him to become one of the most cultured emperors in Chinese history. So the Qing Dynasty was emulating the Ming Dynasty in many ways and having some success, but they also began to emulate them in in the same ways that led to the decline of the Ming, and that is ethnocentrism and isolationism, which also begins again with the Qing dynasty. In 1724, the emperor actually banned Christianity when the pope condemned Confucianism. And by 1750, the Qing dynasty was in decline. With a rising population, this led to more corruption, crime, and banditry. Another great emperor, Emperor Qianlong, who we'll talk about later, continued the Ming policy of isolation and restricting of foreign trade. Um, this, again, created a sense of corruption and a black market that would undercut the Chinese economy and lead to their ultimate decline in period five. And the common problem that the Manchus had, that the Ming had as well, was that they believed they were superior and that the inferior should come to them and seek out their goods, not the other way around. This was the Confucian ideal, right, of a superior and an inferior, and both roles they, they must play. 
And just to wrap up the Qing Dynasty, again, we see that the Qing did bring stability and a time of peace and prosperity to China. They expanded their borders. They dominated the region by having tributary states in Korea and in uh, Vietnam. They had the great rule of Kangxi, who led to a golden age, and they continued the policy of isolation and strict economic regulation. This is going to be key because it's the polar opposite of what the Europeans are going to be doing in the same time period. So we are going to have a shift in the balance of power as China is isolating themselves and tucking themselves in Europe is on the verge of expansion and pushing themselves out. This dynamic will lead to a major turning point in history, and it really is one of the big ideas of period four. See you tomorrow. Have a good one.